Okay, welcome. This is Monday, June 7, our class session at 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations at Delta College. And today is an exciting day, not simply because you are handing in your first exam, which you're doing, but because we get to open up a critical, critical topic today. And this critical topic is gonna cost us a week or so. Well, I, I, I'm trying to think, I'll look on our outline. Are we doing chapter three entirely in one week? No, we even need a kind of like a week and a couple days to do chapter three. We'll go to our website later. But linear systems is the critical topic. It's, well, it's one of the critical topics in this class. I had teased you earlier that you do not know what the meaning of linear is. Not that you do not know, but no one's ever told you the true meaning of the word linear, like showing you the true nature of the force. And I'm not ready to tell you what the true meaning of the word linear is. I will be ready to tell you after we finish chapter three, when we look at some problems in chapter five then we will know the true meaning of the word linear. But you, you get a, you're gonna get a big, big glimpse of what this word means in this chapter and how valuable that word is. Now, let me go over the housekeeping things and take a tour of the website and then we'll get back to our advice today. So remember exam one is due tonight by 11.59 p.m. Today is Monday, June 7. So, you know, I've been answering questions periodically uh, over the weekend, and that's fine. Uh, if you want any final questions, you know, I will be available today on and off, but not always online. So, you know, email me and earlier is better than later, because I can't guarantee that I'm going to be available at 11 p.m. or something like that. So you're finishing up your exam that's due tonight, and then you're gonna move on to the next homework. I promised you that we would have a more measured pace after the first two weeks, and that is indeed the case. In these first two weeks, we looked at 15 sections in the book out of the 34 we're gonna do. We still haven't gone halfway, but we only went a third of the way in the course. So the first thing I'm gonna show you, let's go to our webpage just to give you a concept of the volume of the work we're doing. So we're looking at our website and I'm making sure that you're looking at the website. Very good. It's interesting, why can I make that different size? Okay, good. Let me blow this up for readability. But here we are, Math 264 homepage. A reminder that exam one is posted and you submit it to the assignments folder just like you submit all your homework problems as a single PDF file. Uh, link to class sessions, which you must have found since you're here. Office hour link, uh, Math 264 assignments link. Uh, there was a question today in the office hour regarding the second problem to the exam. So remember, I'll scan and post those notes later, but I don't record that session. Here we are in week three, and here's kind of a a basic summary of what week three is about. I'll let you read that. And uh, we're getting into some fancy words here like matrix and eigenvalues and something like that. Some of you have heard those words before, some of you haven't. If you haven't heard those words before, don't worry about it at all because you're gonna be able to satisfy everything you need to know without too much stress. But I want you to get a picture of the volume of the work we're doing. So laying the foundation week one, you guys really worked hard. I mean, that's, that's almost not fair to do nine sections in one week, but it's gonna pay off later. Remember week two was even an abbreviated week. So we were still working on a pace of three sections a day. But now, 
you know, that's, that's still a pace of nine sections per week if it was a full week, if it wasn't for the Memorial Day holiday. But now we're gonna do a little more focus. So five sections this week and the next week and the next week. And then the last week as we're winding down, we've baked it in for four sections. So after you get this test submitted and returned, now you've gone through the whole cycle of everything we're doing in the class. Submit homework, return homework, grade report, submit test, return test, grade report, homeworks. Now you kind of know my system. And the second test will be similar to the first test. The third test will be similar to the second test. They only deal with the sections that we're covering in that space. We got the tests compartmentalized. There's no giant common final test. You know, it depends on how you feel about those things from this, your side of the table. A comprehensive test can be helpful and not helpful. Individual tests can be helpful and not helpful. They all have their pluses and minuses. But here's what I said in week three and week four, we're working on chapter three. It's a critical, critical chapter for this course, any introduction to differential equations course. There are seven sections in chapter three. We're gonna do them all. Uh, you might be a little bit concerned. You say, Dave, you've got those last two sections out of order. And I say, no. I almost always like to follow the order that an author uses. And, and no author expects you to use every section in the book. I, I think the author had a purpose when they put the sections in that order. And as far as you can, I, I kind of like to follow it. And even if I followed the author's sections in order, you'd still be in very good shape. But there's a little point to 3.7 and 3.6 that I want to emphasize three, seven kind of tying the chapter up in a bow. And that's the way the author looked at it. But three, seven also ties the concepts of the first five sections up into a bow. So inverting sections three, six and three, seven is not an error. It's not a mistake. It's just the way I wanted to speak to you about it. Then we check out a couple of sections in chapter five. Then chapter four is an entire unit. Then we're gonna do a funny little appendix and then we're head to another killer, killer topic in this class. It's chapter six, which is the Laplace transform. Again, an essential topic for any of your future classes. This Laplace transform is just like a machine that eats differential equations, spits out answers but you have to be able to operate the machine. Okay, so there's the kind of perspective on the class. As we go into week three, you got your standard outline. You got your assessments. Now it's not three problems a day right now, and I don't think it's gonna go back to three problems a day. It's gonna be one and two problems a day. And I think we'll talk about sections three, one and three, two today, for the most part, probably all of three, two. But just in case we didn't progress, then I put problems from 3.2 and 3.3 into the next homework and 3.4 and 3.5 into the last homework this week. And then of course, Thursday, we'll just be practicing examples. Here's your reminder that exam one is available here and it's due in our assignments folder tonight by 11.59. So whatever link to the assignments folder you want to use, it all goes to the same folder. Okay, good. And then uh, peek ahead to the next exam, which is chapters three and five. Uh, well, okay, I'm, is four in there or not in there? Notice I did chapter five before chapter four. And again, there's a purpose to that, which we'll explain at the time. We're not doing all of chapter five. Now, one more thing I want to show you on the web page because I wrote it in red on my paper. So this week, here are your handouts. Your ordinary class session, office hours, technology tips, that's kind of always been there. But now let's get to the core here, these linear system handouts right here. These are very important, they're, they're like gold. 
So if we were in a classroom together, I would print each of these. Each of these is a single sheet. Well, I think maybe one or two of them have two sheets. But a single sheet, <coughs> single sheet back and front if necessary. Every one of these is like gold to you. And I want you to read and process them thoroughly. If we were in a classroom, I would print them out and hand each one of you a booklet like this with these 12, 13 sheets here, I think. Three, six, nine, 12, 13 sheets. There you go. 13 is a nice number. So absolutely read these very thoroughly. I mean, if I was really being obnoxious, I'd say memorize them. But uh, you'll see why as we go along. They're key, core, practical handouts. As we get into the videos then, the first order system basics is from chapter two. And you've already watched those videos, most likely. And uh, I left them on there for comparison. So what I have here is four blocks of linear system videos. And again, all the videos are two, three minutes long, maybe. I don't think many are above three minutes. And these are golden. These are core, core concepts. And it might help you if this is the first day you've heard the word matrix or vector or matrix multiplication or trace and determinant. I just give you quick, simple explanations and meanings for all these. That's under linear systems basics. So that's the kind of thing we'll talk about today. And then when we talk about the fancy word eigenvalues, and here's different ways to interpret what that means. This second block here is heading up to section 3.3. Three. And then the sec next block, third, third block of linear systems videos, this is all about section 3.4, where we have to do a slightly fancier arithmetic. We're going to do arithmetic with the complex numbers and not with the real numbers. And at first, that makes sometimes it makes people nervous, but actually doing arithmetic with the complex numbers is easier than with the real numbers, except you've spent your whole life doing arithmetic with complex numbers, uh, with the real numbers. It's easier to multiply complex numbers. It's easier to divide complex numbers. But it's not the arithmetic I'm teaching you so much as why do we need them and how can you work efficiently with them? And then this last batch of linear systems videos, the bifurcation cases, this is about sections three, five and three, seven in a way. So all of the handouts are golden. All the videos are golden. And I also say this on my written paper, which we'll come back to in a second, that my personal notes, especially, where are they? Oh, under resources, handouts, lecture notes. Yeah, you know, some of these are take them or leave them. Now remember, I actually read my notes to you, just about read them to you last week in chapter two. I could do the same thing today, but I told you I do not like to do that. I don't think that's helpful for you at all. So we're going to talk a lot more about the philosophy today. But there is under 3.2, lecture notes in 3.2, there's four pages that I think, again, are essential that you should read. And they are from 45. Now, these are just my goofy handwritten notes, right? 45. But then here's the neater ones, 45A, 45B, C, and D, where I tried to make a very careful explanation and example. So, you can take the lecture notes or leave them, use them if you want to use, you know, that's up to you. I wrote those, as I said, for my benefit. But these four pages would really help you organize things, I think. Okay, so that is the plan. Uh, under technology, there's certainly some Mathematica, oops, I'm on my resources page. That's why there's too many of those there. Let's go back to week three page, technology. 
we got some just basic mathematical worksheets to help us understand first order linear systems. And first order systems is from last week. I leave it up there for comparison. And then in an email, I showed you that I uh, gave you an example with a much more precise way of coloring your phase portraits. Now, this first order linear systems notebook in Mathematica is all you'll need to do any of the graphics in chapter three. I've got it set up and ready for you. But if you want to color things differently or something like that, you can look at the example in this stream plot coloring example. Phase portraits in chapter three and beyond are much, much more important to us. You were just experimenting with them in chapter two is a, is this good enough? Is this enough? Is this not enough? In chapter three, and then in, again, in the applications of chapter five, the face portraits are really important. So we're gonna be much more careful about exactly what we want in a face portrait. And we may get to some examples today. Okay, so that's the tour. Remember this is week three, you got a third of the course in the book. And by the end of this week, you have a half of the course in the book. So that's how demanding this presentation is. So to summarize, linear system handouts on our chapter three web pages, uh, chapter three material, very important, read them and practice them thoroughly. Likewise, the batches of linear systems videos, watch all of them as we work through chapter three. You might rewatch them. And there's a few pages in my personal lecture notes. You can read all the lecture notes if you want. I don't think they're that exciting. But these pages from 45A to 45D are probably very useful. Okay, let's give you the philosophical take on the direction we're going. So, like I said, I could literally read all those notes I just pointed out to you. It would, it would not be good for you. It would not be good for me. You wouldn't even absorb the things because you almost got to read them yourself. But what I can do is I can give you the philosophy of why we're doing this with the practical examples. And then the things you read there will hopefully be just, you know, aha, aha, okay, I understand. Oh, that's why you do that or that's how you do that. So first we're gonna do a little recap here before we explain exactly what a linear system is and exactly what you do with it. We're even gonna jump into a little bit of linear algebra. And in the first week when you guys answered me, told me some of the things we're doing, some people said, oh yeah, I've taken linear algebra class or no, I haven't. My last class was Calc 3. If you've taken a linear algebra class already, uh, you've done much, much more than we're about to do. But you'll be familiar with some of the words and things that we do, and that'll make it more real to you more quickly. If you haven't taken a linear algebra class before, I don't want you to be worried about it at all, because we're gonna be using linear algebra in a practical sense and not in a high powered or fancy sense. And that'll be more meaningful you, to you in a second. But I could say it like this, the, the worst thing we're gonna do in this whole presentation is a two by two matrix. And if you don't know what that is, you'll know in a few minutes. And if you've taken a linear algebra class, you've done a lot more than that. But here, is a powerful application of linear algebra. We might talk about linear algebra more later. So let's give a flyby, 50,000 foot flyby of what we were doing so far. This was chapter one, first order differential equation. And we wanted tools for solving this. So we did analytic, numeric, and qualitative. And what we did is varieties of this. Remember I had this phrase that the 
slope function, f is the slope function, could be any messed up combination of t's and y's in the universe. So we started snapping off simpler cases, like what if the t's and y's were kind of separated? In fact, the word for this was separable, right? That was made it easier to approach. What if there were no T's or there were no Y's? That problem, I will keep writing dy dt here just because it's an introduction. Now pretty soon, by the way, uh, just for the sake of my aching hand, don't be afraid to write y prime. I mean, we almost always use t as the independent variable. So if I write y prime, I mean dy dt. I mean the derivative of y with respect to t. And it's a lot easier to write this. I don't mind if you write y prime. It's a standard way people write first order equations. So what if t and y could be separated? What if there was no y? What if there was no t? This had its valuable point too. And then the last thing we did in chapter one is, what if there was only one single y that showed up? And this is what we call linear. This was what we called autonomous. This is what we called integral. And this is what we called separable. This, if you want to assign it to a name, would just be general. Okay, a linear, autonomous, separable, those are standard words. Some people use the word integral here. Some people just don't use any word at all. General is a pretty common word. Sorry, I gotta get the paper up. So what we were doing is breaking a big problem into pieces that we could bite off and chew. And linear was important because it was the one example in chapter eight that I gave you two methods for an exact answer. The method of undetermined coefficients and the method of the integrating factor. Don't forget this. This will be the last of our replay today. The foundation of them all, the mother of all differential equations, the most valuable equation in all differential equations was this equation right here. Now, I want you to think about this equation right here. And here the A is a constant and not a function of T. So you could call it a constant function of t if you want, or just a constant like three or seven or 12 or one fifth. This was the MVP of ODEs. And you can solve those on site. You can look at one of those and just write down the answer given initial condition. You don't even have to do the work. You know how to do that. If not, you haven't watched this video. But think about this. This is linear. Isn't it linear? It's linear with b equals zero. In fact, this was called homogeneous and linear. Guess what? It's autonomous. There's no t on this side. Legally, in fact, it's separable because I could divide both sides by y and multiply both sides by dt. So when I say this is the most valuable problem, I'm not kidding. It's like the building stone. It's like the cornerstone, the foundation stone of all these cases separable, autonomous, and linear. The only one it doesn't apply to necessarily is integral. Okay, so this equation is gonna be a star for us today, but in a new context. Okay, now we're ready to define what a linear system is. Well, I got to say, let's say, which way should we go with this? Should I give you a little introductory speech about linear algebra? Or should I actually define what a linear system is? 
let's define first order linear system. And then I'll do our little uh, linear algebra detour. And then we'll take a break likely and come back to the system. By the way, if there's humming you hear in the background, it's the washing machine because I'm stuck in my basement. I have not given you the tour of the workshop basement television studio here, have I? I'll do that another day. So now I'm gonna define a first order linear system. And I could say of ordinary differential equations, but you know, that's kind of, I take that phrase for granted now because the only thing we do in this class is ordinary differential equations. Another day, you'll do partial differential equations. But this is a first order linear system. If A, E, C, and D are real numbers, Don't be freaked out about the complex numbers. We're going to use them in a special case where they actually speed our calculations. But essentially everything else we do in this class, we talk about functions only as functions of real number. Then the x dt equals ax plus by and dy dt equals cx plus dy is a first order linear system of dimension two, or you can say of two dimensions. Dimensions, got it. Okay, now there's so many letters floating around here. Let's make really sure we're clear on what letters are what. Okay, always foundation, T, the independent variable, most commonly for us it's time, but it could be any independent variable x and y dependent variables. These are functions of t that we're trying to discover. The dx dt and the dy dt are descriptions of the rate of change of x and y. <coughs> Excuse me. And here it says dx dt and the dy dt, notice this, depend only on x and y in the first power. No sign of x, no x cubed, no x times y, no x divided by the log of y, just straight up one x, one y, one x, one y. And the a, b, and c, and d are just parameters, real numbers. I want you to compare that to what we called the MVP of ODs a second ago. This is like this, but it's only dimension one. See, if I chopped off that part like that. That would be the MVP of ODEs right there. Looks exactly like that, although I have a different letter for the dependent variable. So that's, I call this linear two. Notice that the first order linear system here is autonomous. I guess I should throw that in as a descriptor, as an adjective, because there's no dependence on time on the right-hand side, other than through X or Y. The A, B, and C could be any real numbers under the sun. Again, this begs the question, why linear? And for a moment, I'll still let you believe that linear means line. For example, you used to write lines in this equation. 
AX plus BY equals C, you know, like 3X minus 2Y equals 7. That is clearly a line. This is the equation of a line. It's called the general equation of the line. And it looks like I'm making those right here. It looks like I'm making lines right here, but these aren't lines. There's just a linear combination of the X's and the Y's in both these slots. Okay, now it's time for linear algebra. So remember, we also looked at first order systems in the context of a vector field. So what's the vector field in this problem? I could remember rewrite that as dx dt dy dt. I'm gonna abstract this all the way out. And then I could rewrite that as dx dt is ax plus by, and dy dt is cx plus dy. And I could make this more abstract by like pulling out the derivative. I could say the derivative with respect to T of the vector X and Y. And I'm allowed to do that without any explanation because in calculus three, you learned that the derivative of a vector is the vector of the derivatives. That's standard calc three, what's called vector calculus. But over here, I'm gonna do something a little bit funnier. And at first, more mysterious. Let me rewrite the ax plus by, cx plus dy vector in this fashion. a, b, c, d times x, y. Now again, I'm not teasing you with that word linear algebra, but I'm just saying, if you've taken linear algebra class before, you've seen someone write like this. If you haven't, don't worry about it. This is the beginning of linear algebra. This is called a matrix. And it's only a little bit more sophisticated than this thing right here, which was called a vector. So you've accepted the existence of vectors, even vectors that are many, many more slots. Now I want you to think of a matrix as a combination of two vectors, or it would be more proper to call it the rectangular array of numbers. Maybe you do other things. You're interested in computers, computer science, programming. Maybe the word array means something else to you. But I promise you the word array in computer science is exactly what the word matrix means to a mathematician. And you, you have some fancy things you do with arrays in computer science. Uh, no less fancy than things we do with this matrix. If you don't like the word matrix, if you don't like the word array, let's call it a table. A table is something that almost everybody understands. Okay, let's look at the box scores of the Tiger game last night. It's presented in a table. Let's look at uh, the output of the, the gross metric product of the countries of the European Union over the last 10 years, it's presented in a table. So tables are a way of organizing information and likewise, matrix array, just methods of organizing information. But they have other practical functions. So the first thing we're gonna do is point out to you that I treated this matrix and this vector as things that were to be multiplied. And in fact, when I multiply them, the result is this vector right here, AX plus BY, CX plus DY. So I guess I have to show you how to multiply matrices.
And here's the way you multiply matrices. You called it in vector calculus, in a way, the dot product. Do you remember when you had one, three, and minus two dotted with uh, four, zero, and negative one? Now, I'm using standard notation possibly from a calculus class where you wrote vectors horizontally with pointy brackets. Well, everybody's got a different way of writing a vector. We're gonna to tend to write them as columns. So if you rather I write them as columns, I'll go right ahead and write them as columns. One, three, minus two, dotted with four, zero, minus one. It does not matter for the operation called dot product. Dot product literally had an instruction is that you multiply each slot and then you add together the products of each slot. So whether you write it horizontally or vertically, it doesn't matter. It's four plus zero plus two. So the dot product is six. And again, I present that without any hesitation or uh, explanation whatsoever. You did dot products in calculus three. You actually possibly did dot products in your trigonometry or pre-calculus class. It's an operation you perform on vectors. Well, now I can tell you how to multiply matrices. You multiply matrices by dotting each row of the first matrix with each column of the second matrix. So when I dot the vector AB, the row vector, with the column vector XY, I get A times X plus B times Y. That's what goes in the first slot. And when I dot the row vector CD with the column vector XY, I get CX plus DY. So it's just two dot products here. And it's a different way to write a dot product, if you like to say it that way. You, in, if you want, I could have written dot product in your traditional calculus class like this. One, three, minus two times four, zero, minus one. There is many different notations for doing this as there are people, but these are three common notations. And we're gonna be focusing more on this notation. So if I created a linear system for you, here's just an example off the cuff. And this is uh, 3x minus 2y, dx dt and dy dt is uh, x plus 5y. This would be the same thing as writing 3 minus 2, 1, 5 times xy equals the derivative with respect to t of xy. So these two presentations are the same system. The three and the minus two, the one, there's a one there, and the five are called the coefficients, right? So this matrix is called the matrix of coefficients. Now to save me trouble when I'm writing, sometimes I just write the matrix of coefficients with a capital letter A, and I understand that to be a matrix. Likewise, I could write the vector XY as a capital letter Y and call that a vector. And then on the right-hand side, do you understand I'm taking the derivative with respect to T of Y? So there's another way I could write a first order linear system. Three versions of a first order linear system. They are all the same. They're just different in their brevity. This is very expressive showing you every single piece. This is showing you all the pieces, but in the effective calculational matrix format. And this is showing you all the pieces in a handy notational manipulation format. Plus, hint, hint, that looks darn close to what we used to call 
the MVP of ODEs. Okay, so we're gonna tie lots and lots of things together today. <clears throat> okay, I'm not done taking my tour of linear algebra. Now, we are, uh, oh, by the way, when you, when you write a matrix, so let's go to the next page. Let's just get you your matrix vocabulary while we're here. Uh, when you write a vector and a matrix, let's say there's the vector one, three, two, and here's the matrix uh, one minus one, zero, two, four, 13. Now I can use fractions or radicals. I can use anything I want, but I'm just pulling numbers out of the top of my head. When you talk about a matrix, you automatically examine its rows and columns. So this matrix right here has three rows, one, two, three rows. This matrix has two rows. This matrix has one column. This matrix has three columns. So you always talk about a matrix by mentioning its rows and columns. This is called a two by three matrix. And this sounds funny the first time you hear it, but two by three is called the dimension of the matrix. Not the two, not the three, the two by three. Two by three is the dimension or if you wanna think about it in practical English, the size of the matrix. This is therefore a three by one matrix. And I promise you, we're not gonna do anything but two by two matrices, but you can multiply all sorts of matrices. One minus one, zero, two, four, 13 times one, three, two. As long as you can make a legal dot product, you can multiply matrices. So because this matrix has three columns and this matrix has three rows, I can legally dot the rows with the columns. Notice this is a two by three matrix and this is a three by one matrix. So the fact that I can legally dot those, that I can multiply these two matrices is indicated by the three. They, number of columns in the first matrix equals the number of rows in the second, two by three. And not only that, when you're done, do you notice I can only make two dot products here? And the first dot product is minus two, first row dotted with first column. And the second dot product is two plus 12 plus 26. Why did I do that? Two plus 12 is 14 plus 26 is 40. And notice that this is a two by one matrix. So when you multiply matrices, you're always good as long as columns in the first match the number of rows in the second. Otherwise you cannot proceed. And when you multiply two matrices, you create a new table. And this new table has the dimension of the rows of the first times columns of the second. Now that means if someone asks you to multiply these two, one, two, three, four, and these two matrices, one, two, zero, seven, five, negative one, that you simply refuse. You cannot make a dot product one, two with 105. Those are different size vectors. The two by two matrix, this is a three by two matrix, cannot be multiplied. We're in our very short linear algebra lesson today. On the other hand, if I wrote them in the other order, one, two, zero, seven, five minus one, and one, two, three, four, the number of columns here, I'm sorry, yeah, the number of columns here matches the number of rows here. So it's perfectly legal to multiply them. And you can even tell me how big the answer is gonna be. The answer is going to be 
three by two. Why? Because there are six dot products I can form. And so I'm gonna run through the six dot products very quickly. So you know, check to me to make sure I'm doing this correct. Seven, uh, 10, 21, 28, 32, 2 and 6. I didn't do that too quickly. But each one of those, like the 28, notice the 28 is in the second row and second column. And that's the result of doing the second row dotted with the second column. 0 times 2 plus 7 times 4 is 28. OK, so now you know how to multiply matrices. You can add matrices. Again, you can add matrices if they're the same size. It would be ridiculous for me to tell you to add these two matrices because they're different sizes. It's like adding apples and oranges. Now, for those of you in a computer science background or a data science background, you would actually say to me, but uh, I can add those two arrays. Well, what you would do legally is you'd probably say, uh, I'm a, I'll consider this array to have no values in these last two slots. I'll call these null values. So I'm not talking about applications outside of mathematics. Right now I'm talking about mathematics. If the two matrices are the same size, you can add them and subtract them. If they don't have the same size, you cannot add them and subtract them because they'd be like adding apples and oranges. Okay. You can multiply matrices, add, subtract, multiply, uh, add, subtract matrices. You might ask, may I divide matrices? And the answer is yes and no. Division for matrices will have a different meaning. And it's, it's not the thing that we're most, most focused on today, but maybe there's another day I'll show you exactly what it means to divide by matrices. In fact, since it's so different than what you call division in a way, people do not actually speak about dividing matrices. They talk about inverting them. So for example, if I asked you to solve the problem 3x equals seven, you would say I divided both sides by three and got x equals seven thirds. In matrix language, I would rather say I multiplied both sides by the inverse of three and I still got seven thirds. So in numbers, do you understand that when you use the word divide or inverse, you're almost saying the same thing, but you have to be careful. In matrices, we don't use the word divide, we only use the word inverse. And uh, it's not a central topic for us. In fact, I'm overdoing it entirely when I give you a matrix that's three by two, because we're never gonna do any matrices in this class that are not two by two or two by one. Yes, what should we say about this two by one matrix right here? Is it a two by one matrix? Or is it a two dimensional vector? The answer is it's not really important to answer that question. I can call this a matrix, a two by one matrix, or I can call it a two by one vector or a two dimensional vector and no one would care. Uh, common notation, nearing the end of our brief linear algebra course. When you talk about vectors, it is kind of common to put arrow hats on them. And that's to tell someone that X is not a number. It's not like two, it's a list of numbers, it's a vector. When you talk about matrices, that have both rows and columns, then maybe I should put two arrow hats on them. No, nobody does that. It's common when people talk about matrices to use capital letters. So you could call this matrix A, you could call this matrix B, you could call this 
matrix over here. C, just get it used to in the context of chapter three, capital letters being matrices. Okay, a couple more things, and then we are ready to take a break and then ready to explore first order linear systems. Let me tell you some other things about matrices. Okay, so it's page four. More matrix vocabulary. So here's a matrix. Let's give it a really nice one. Three minus seven, two. Any number I please. I'll put fractions in there another day, but today I'm just making up samples. So now you understand what I mean if I call this a two by two matrix. Or dimension two by two. Not dimension four, this is not two times two, this is two by two. Like the wood that frames your house is a two by four. And that means it's two inches by four inches. It's literally a matrix of wood. Well, but I might be stretching the word there, shouldn't I? Possibly. Uh, you, you recognize that even though this has two rows and two columns, there is no misunderstanding that the first number refers to the rows. And the second number refers to the columns, always, never the other way around. So make sure you don't mess that up. Uh, matrices, and this is kind of a general statement, philosophical statement. Matrices are like super numbers. You know, the, the, the number one, three, minus seven, two, those are four numbers. But when I put them together in that matrix right there, what I'm doing is creating a super number or uh, what do we call it? Marvel Comics Universe. Oh yeah, I guess, or, or The Incredibles. There's an Incredibles poster in the basement here. Who are The Incredibles? The Incredibles were supers because they had extra powers. And uh, I, what, what do you call it in the Marvel comic universe? The, the word escapes me. But I forgot whether they use supers or not. But matrices are like super numbers. Matrices are like, if you want to do it in a more crude sense, numbers on steroids. Super powered numbers. And you say, but Dave, it's not a number, it's four numbers. It's a table. But the more you think about matrices and see what they can do, the more you will feel that matrices are like I just described them. Matrices have superpowers. Okay. Now I got to tell you all the superpowers. But I also have to tell you all their characteristics. So back to the vocabulary. When you have a matrix and you add the numbers on the main diagonal, when you have a square matrix from the upper left to the lower right, it's called the main diagonal. Now, some people are in the habit of calling this other diagonal the off diagonal, kind of the leftover diagonal, but that's not standard vocabulary. The main diagonal, when you add the numbers on the main diagonal, you get what's called the trace of the matrix A. Let's call this matrix A. And this matrix has a trace of three. Now, if the matrix was four by four, Four, one, three, two, seven, negative zero, five, six, nine, one, two, seven, one, 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 one. And its trace is still some of the numbers on the main diagonal. So this is matrix B. 
and the trace of B is four plus zero plus two plus one, seven. So trace is something that applies only to square matrices. I don't talk about the trace of a three by two matrix. Really, now take fancy, fancy linear algebra class, maybe someone will give you a different story. Maybe second or third linear algebra class, maybe. Here's another word. Oh, by the way, most some people abbreviate trace like this. Some people abbreviate trace like that, TA. Some people just say T for trace. That's what these authors do. So you'll get used to that. They don't say T of A, they just say T, trace, three. The other special word here before we take a break is called determinant. Determinant. And for a two by two matrix, the determinant is very easy to calculate. It's the product of the main diagonal, subtract the product of the off diagonal. So here it's one times two minus negative seven times three. That is two minus negative 21. Two minus negative 21 is 23. People say determinant like this. People say determinant like this. People say determinant like this. That's the way these authors do it. People sometimes say the word determinant like absolute values, which I have some sympathy for. That's a standard way of writing determinant. What does absolute value mean, by the way? Absolute value of a real number is kind of like its size. Even the absolute value of a complex number is the size of the complex number in some sense. So in a way possibly is determinant the size of the matrix? Uh, no, I don't want to use the word size and dimension. I don't want to get you confused about that. But you could say in a way it's a measurement of something like that. Problem is linear algebra been around a long time. So over many years, people use different symbols and they don't ask for your permission and they don't ask for the dead people's permission from 100 years ago. They just do it. So when you're reading, make sure you understand the context and the symbol they're using. One more thing before we take a break. And that is, understand what matrices are. Matrices are super numbers. Matrices are numbers on steroids. If you allow me to be too poetic, matrices are people. I think that's a little too poetic. But just like you have your driver's license, there's a terrible mock up of your driver's license. In fact, your driver's license just basically has your face, right? And what do they put on the driver's license? All your key information. In the old days, would be height, weight, hair color. Now it's generally height. That's something that doesn't change too much. Weight changes a bit. Hair color can change a bit. But but basically, let's let's you know go traditional. Height, weight, hair color. These are facts about you. That you're five foot eleven. That you weigh two hundred pounds that you are blonde. Maybe that's what my driver's license says. And when the public safety officer, the police officer pulls me over because I did something and I wasn't paying attention driving the car, what's the first thing to say? May I see your license and registration? Because they identify you. So when someone hands you a matrix, the first thing you do, a square matrix, trace and determinant are concepts for square matrices. When someone hands you a matrix, when you pull over a matrix, the very first thing you do is ask for its license. And on its license, 
the matrix has a license. Where the two most important pieces of information are the trace and the determinant. So I'm trying to be funny in a way, but I'm not being funny. The very first thing you do if someone hands you a matrix is you write down its trace and determinant because those are key identifying qualities of the matrix and they are very important in calculations. What if the matrix is not square? Then we are not going to talk about its trace and determinant. What if the matrix is four by four? What's the determinant of this four by four matrix? You know, I could tell you, but it doesn't interest us. We're not going to do four by four matrices. We're only gonna talk about two by two matrices. Then your next question is two by two matrices. You're cheating me. Uh, two by two matrices, I did that in high school. I did that in some other place. I did that in math camp. And the funny thing is, even though two by two matrices are simple and basic, they describe some ridiculously powerful reality. So by the time we're done, you will not be cheated. You will not even feel cheated that all we did was talk about two by two matrices. But if you'd like to learn more about matrices, then you're welcome to take a linear algebra class where they'll fully explain what the determinant of this four by four matrix is. I cannot calculate it on site, but it would not be hard to calculate. By the way, if you need backup anytime you're using a matrix, any standard calculator now would allow you to add, subtract, multiply, and invert matrices. Any standard calculator would tell you the trace and determinant of a matrix if you gave it a proper matrix, a square matrix. So you have not only the ability to calculate, which we'll show you, but you also have backup in your back pocket with your calculator or on your computer. Okay, that is a very, very quick, leaving some things out, description of linear algebra. And, but we're gonna do much more linear algebra. And even if you know what matrix is, trace determinant and so forth, it's not wrong to do this, to make sure everybody's on the same page. But I want you to think of trace and determinant as things you feel, not as calculations you make. So if you've done fancier traces and determinants, on bigger matrices, don't worry about it. But I want you to understand trace and determine our key identification factors for a matrix. This is kind of scary. Okay, that took a little bit of time, but it was worth it. So let's come back at 112. Very valuable. And remember today we're not trying to bring three sections past you. Be happy if I do one and a half-ish. So you take a break, stretch your legs, and I'm gonna do the same, mute my microphone, and then we'll be right back.
Okay, we're back. I'm going to jot some notes over here on the side because I want to. First thing I'm going to do is actually show you an example because we've talked too much. So let me think about this carefully. If I do that, and I'm just doing some calculation off to the side here. My apologies. Something is not right. Okay. There, let's try that. And then yes, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's go back to differential equations. But uh, again, uh, for the, if you've done matrices before, you've done them somewhere, you've done them even in calculus three a little bit. Don't, I don't want you to think of what I just presented to you as an insulting version of what matrices are, what linear algebra is. I want you to think of it as a humanistic version of what matrices or linear algebra is. Linear algebra is a tool and it has a personality. In fact, it's at this moment, one of the hottest, hottest tools in mathematics because of that word that I used earlier, array or data science. So this is littered all over the hottest topics in mathematics right now, linear algebra, array, data science, machine learning. That's another way to use matrices. But in the old days, matrices were thought of as, linear algebra was kind of thought of as a servant of differential equations. And you would have taken a course in linear algebra and differential equations or differential equations with linear algebra. So sometimes in schools, you actually have this course called differential equations and linear algebra, two courses in one, thinking that linear algebra is the servant of differential equations. And so it is, but linear algebra has come into its own right now. So when, when you went to a college or university, you either saw linear algebra and differential equations as one course, or you saw linear algebra and differential equations as two courses, but still the linear algebra served the differential equations. Now it's almost the reverse, that other mathematics courses are serving linear algebra. Maybe I can give you some other examples in a way. Remember when I did the SIR model, I also put a Mathematica notebook up there called SIR model, discrete SIR model. And that would be something where you'd, in a sense, get a peek of something that linear algebra could do. But I don't think we have time to explore that at this time. Okay, let's get to our first example. And we're gonna make strong connection to the MVP of ODEs. So let's say I give you the equation dy dt is minus three y and y of zero is seven. I don't even want you to blink. You should already have written that answer down on your piece of paper. Y of t is seven e to the minus three t. And if someone challenged you, say, I don't believe you. Remember this is the difference between mathematics and some of the other sciences, <laughs> not slamming other sciences. It doesn't matter whether someone believes you or not. You can show that when you put in zero, this becomes seven. And when you differentiate it, you get minus three times the original. That's kind of funny, isn't it? In this problem, differentiation is multiplication.
Think about that phrase for a second. When I differentiate this, these rules of calculus, minus three comes down, chain rule, I get minus three times seven e to the minus three t. I get negative 21 e to the minus three t. But don't let that obscure the fact that it's minus three times this function, minus three times y. So one of the things that makes the exponential function so powerful is that for an exponential function, differentiation is multiplication. If you allow me to even uh, emphasize that word a little more carefully, differential, differentiation is scalar multiplication. That is, it is a scaling. Scaling is when you multiply something, stretch it or shrink it. So when I differentiate 70 to the minus 3t, I scale it by a factor of minus 3. So I'm going to say differentiation is scalar multiplication. That is the core of the MVP of ODEs. Now, let's look at this example. And I'll write down a very simple system for you. And uh, I have to give you some initial conditions like at t equals zero, x naught, y naught is oh, what the heck? Why don't we use the seven and minus three? No, okay. I, mean, I don't want to make. I don't want to mix these up in that way. Let's just pick something harmless like one and minus two. So this is an initial value problem for a first order equation. This is an initial value problem for a first order system. First order equation. First order system. But I want to use my matrix transforming powers. So what I'm going to do is slowly rewrite this as dx dt dy dt. Pretty soon I'm just going to write x prime y prime. Save myself some trouble writing, right? Equals 2x plus y, x plus 2y. And then I'll use my matrix writing powers to write this as dx dt of xy equals 2, 1, 1, 2 times xy. Now, by the way, this is neither here nor there but this matrix is symmetric about the main diagonal. So it's called a symmetric matrix. But we're, we're not studying the superpowers of symmetric matrices today. Now one more time, so I need another color. Let's write this in the most compact form. The y dt, so I'll consider y to be the vector xy, but I made a capital Y and I put a hat on it, so you don't mistake it with a lowercase y. Equals a, that's a kind of a funny looking a, because I almost rewrote the matrix, times y. Now, do you see what's going on? This reminds you very strongly of this. Is there a connection? This says differentiation is scalar multiplication. This says differentiation is matrix multiplication. Now let's think back to this problem. dy dt is ay, where a is a scalar. This had a dirt simple answer. 
you didn't even have to do the calculations after you got used to doing this. You just wrote down the A and the coefficient. And the minus three became part of the exponential. Wow, that would be nice. If I can do these problems on site instantly, if I can instantly write down the answer to this problem, first order equation, exponential growth, if I can instantly write down the answer to this problem when I see it, can I instantly write down the answer to this problem? So can I likewise instantly write the answer to this question, to this equation, to this problem? It depends on what we mean by instantly. The answer is yes, you can. But instantly might have a different meaning. Okay, so we're going to explore that. But before we can instantly write down the answer, we have to agree on what an answer is. And we have to learn how to identify fake answers or not answers, right? Let's take this problem to the next page. Uh, I remember what my numbering is. And let's rewrite the problem. I'm going to use this intermediate notation for a second, where I emphasize the entries of the matrix. And I'm going to make this claim. x, y equals, uh, that's where I have to go back over here to my notes. And uh, make some adjustments. So I'm trying to bring up the problem I wanted to do for you. Let me write these two things down. X, Y is one, one, e to the three T, three T. So here is a vector function. X equals e to the three T, Y equals e to the three T. Here's a vector function. X equals, uh, e to the minus t, and y equals minus e to the minus t. And I don't mean to switch colors like that. Which one of these is a solution. That sounds like a very simple question, but it's going to illustrate something really, really important. So which one of these is a solution to this problem? Only one of them is. Now, before I go and do that solution, I want you to be able to be flexible and look at this in another way. Do you look at this vector that's got E3T and E3T in it? 
do you understand that E3T is like a common factor, right? So if you like, you could practice like factoring out the E3T, what would you be left with? A one and one. That would be, here's a vector, here's a function. That's the same way as writing this. They mean the same thing. Likewise, you see the E minus T here. And if you factored it out, you would be left with one and minus one. So let's test number A. Let's differentiate the first function. One, one, e to the three t. When you do that, by the way, you could just say differentiate e3t, t, e3t, t, which is three e3t, t, three e3t, t. differentiate by slots. But I want to emphasize the separate nature of these. <coughs> if you were differentiating seven times e to the three t, what would you do with the seven? Well, it just sits there, it's a constant. You differentiate e3t, three comes down, 21 e3t. Now, likewise here. This is not one constant in front of E3T. This is two constants simultaneously. So what's the derivative of one, one, E to the 3T? The constants just sit there. But I differentiate E to the 3T, make it three E3T. Now I could write that as three, three E3T. I could also write that as multiplied out 3e3t, 3e3t. So be flexible with vectors. That's what happens when I differentiate this function. What happens if I multiply the matrix 2, 1, 1, 2 times this function? Well, again, I'm going to emphasize the 1, 1 e3t-ness here because when I differentiated, do you understand that the constants just sat there and I was operating on the E3T? Now, when I multiply by the matrix, what happens? It's the turn of the E to the 3T to just sit there and the constants are what get together. How do you multiply two, one, one, two times one, one? Two times one plus one times one, three. One times one plus two times one, three. I'm doing fast matrix multiplication though. But that's three, three, E, three, T. Or if you like, three, E, three, T, three, E, three, T. So what did we just find out? There's the answer. Sorry. But differentiation in this problem was not Scalar multiplication, differentiation is what? Matrix multiplication. Now, by the way, that means that this one B must fail, but I'm gonna demonstrate that it fails. I'm gonna demonstrate that it fails quickly because I said only one of these was a solution, right? So let me move my paper up. Now in your brain, you're saying, okay, this is a solution, Dave, but where did you get it? Remember I said, I promise you, you can write down the answers instantly, almost instantly. Instantly is a flexible word. But first of all, let me show you that if you differentiate, one minus one e minus t, you do not get the same thing as if you multiplied two, one, one, two times one minus one e minus t. This is not a hard thing to show. First, when you differentiate this, all you do, these constants just sit there, minus one come down, make this minus one, one, e minus t. Every exponential is its own derivative, but the chain rule says you have to multiply by minus one. 
Now let's do matrix multiplication right here. What's two one times one minus one? It is one. Two times one, subtract one times one. Two times one plus one times minus one. What's one minus, what's one two times one minus one? That is negative one. Now, what do you feel about this? You don't have to feel very much. Close, but no cigar. They are not the same. So this function in blue failed to solve the system. So I want to remind you from the very first day we said this to you, when you do a differential equation, no one can lie to you like, Psst, hey, mister, I've got some Swiss watches over here. And then, you know, they open up their raincoat and show you the Swiss watches, which, you know, you paid $10 for. It's on the corner in New York City. And then they break the next day. Yeah, someone could hand me a watch and say it's a fancy switch watch and I wouldn't know the difference, right? But in math class, no, we don't get fooled. If someone hands me a function and says it works as a solution, it either does or it doesn't. And as long as I follow the ordinary established rules of differentiating, I can know the difference. No one can lie to me in a math class. So how did I get these answers? Well. Not the one that failed. I don't ever want to see that one again. But let's try this one. dx dt dy dt equals equals 2x plus y, x plus 2y. Or in the compact notation, xy or you know dxy dt is 2 1 1 2 8, 7 times xy or in the super compact notation the derivative with respect to t of y the vector xy is a y. How do I know that the two basic solutions of this system are One one e to the three t. That was the one we tested, and it worked. If you like, you can call this y number one. And the other one, I don't want to hold you in suspense. Let's call it y number two. was one minus one ET. If I would have used an ET here, instead of the E minus T, it would have actually worked. Now you can go and verify that. I'm not gonna verify it for you right now, but these two solutions are solutions to this problem, this problem, this problem. And it so happens that by looking at the four numbers, two, one, one, and two, I can find special number three, special number here, which is one times t, the special vector one, one, special vector one minus one. Well, first of all, I'll tell you where I got it from a calculational point of view. But that doesn't help you with the meaning of where I got it. 
but I want to go back. First, I'll show you how to calculate it. And then I'll show you what it means. And this might be the thing that extends into tomorrow. So we're kind of talking about 3, 1 and 3, 2 at the same time right here. So let's examine this matrix. Two, one, one, two. Remember, I told you anytime someone hands you a matrix, the very first thing you do is write down its trace and determine it. So this is a relatively mellow matrix. There's no tricky minus signs to deal with. The trace is two plus two is four. The determinant, be very careful when you do determinants that you actually subtract. Four minus one is three. Now that is compared to, excuse me, this other matrix right here where it was two minus negative 21. Not two minus 21, but two minus negative 21, which was a 23. So be very careful when you do determinant. In fact, if you want to think of determinant like this, if you want a formula for determinant, the determinant of the matrix A, B, C, D, is a times d minus b times c. And you would even see that in your algebra class. The trace of the matrix a, b, c, d is not nearly so fancy. You just say a plus d. So if you want formulas for them, there they are. OK, back, back, back. Five, six, seven, good. Now I'm going to do a new vocabulary word. It's called the characteristic equation of A. And the characteristic equation of A is, now I gotta be very careful here because I'm gonna use a funny letter. Don't get freaked out by the funny letter. I could use a regular variable too, but I'm gonna use a Greek letter for variable. Greek letter lambda squared minus trace times lambda plus determinant. This is called the characteristic equation of the matrix A with trace T and determinant D. Uh, from now on, when I say capital T, I mean trace. When I say capital D, I mean determinant. Those of you taking a linear algebra class and learned characteristic equation from another procedure that's absolutely fine. This is the same, but right now I'm gonna start with this procedure and I'll do something that might remind you of your other procedure later. This is Greek lowercase letter lambda and it's just a traditional letter people use when they do calculations on matrices. It's kind of a historical thing. You know, like baseballs have red stitches. Why don't they have blue stitches? I don't know, they always have red stitches. If I look at this characteristic equation for this particular matrix four and three, let's see what I get right here. Lambda squared minus four lambda. Be careful, it's minus trace, not trace, minus trace. I can explain why later. Plus three equals zero. And this is just an ordinary characteristic equation. It's an ordinary quadratic form. Equation, you know how to solve these. If you get in any trouble, you pull out the quadratic formula, but this actually is a pretty quick one to solve. You just say, oh, I know what I can do. I can factor that. And from factoring it, you get two answers. Either lambda minus three is zero or lambda minus one is zero. That means lambda is three or lambda is one. Lambda minus three equals zero means lambda is three. Lambda minus one equals zero means lambda equals one. Uh, it's neither here nor there, but you know, since I've got two different ones, why don't I call this lambda one and lambda two? 
Now let's go back upstairs. Oh, there's a three there. Oh, there's a one there. Is that a coincidence? The answer is no. This three in my answer and this one in my answer came directly from these values. These two numbers, three and one, are numbers that came from this matrix. They're the roots of the characteristic equation, but they have a more traditional name. They're called the eigenvalues of A. They are like trace and determinant. And I'm gonna do this a couple times to you until it becomes second nature. If a matrix has a driver's license, then printed on that driver's license would be its trace, its determinant, and also its eigenvalues. They are unique identifiers for the matrix. And, and I have to be careful about how I say the word unique, but I'll explain that later. So eigenvalues is some function like my address on my driver's license. It identifies me somehow. Eigenvalues of a matrix are identifiers of that matrix in some way. And if what I'm promising is true, that they become parts of the solutions of the differential equation, well, then that would be pretty good identifiers by my taste. Now, eigenvalues, just from the historical point of view, is from the German eigenwert, and I'm not a very good German speaker, but uh, I would roughly translate this, and you can translate this yourself, Google Translate, whatever, unique value. Unique value, eigen, unique, wert, worth, or value unique worth. These two numbers have a unique worth to A. And the reason it's in German is because when people were doing this first, like German was a famous language for writing mathematical papers and a lot of famous German mathematicians worked out these ideas at the beginning. This is called, an Eigen, we don't say Eigenwert anymore, we just say Eigenvalues. Now I want to do something else for you. So what's a little bit disconcerting about what I just did is I explained where this exponential came from and where this exponential came from, but where did I get these values for the vector? Why did I choose the vector one, one and not the vector three, seven? Why didn't I put the vector one, one over here? The one one and the one minus one, they belong to the eigenvalues. And the one one is called an eigenvector of the eigenvalue Lambda one equals three. Sorry, leave my paper. The one one is an eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue lambda one equals three. In that case, uh, if you want to give it a name, let's call it V one because it belongs to lambda one. And the other vector one minus one is an eigenvector of lambda two equals three. Sorry, lambda two equals one. That was the other one. Let's call it V2. So the solution Y1 is simply the eigenvector 
times e to the eigenvalue t. So solution y2 is the eigenvector e to the eigenvalue lambda 2 t. I'll show you the values of these in a second, but you've already done them in a previous problem in chapter two. The question is, how did I compute these eigenvectors? And I'm giving you the practical speech now. I think next time we're going to do a little more theory as we open up the section where we get going. How do I calculate eigenvectors? What I do is I take the matrix A and I subtract lambda on the main diagonal. For example, when lambda is three, if I multiply by this fancy matrix called the identity matrix, then two, one, one, two, minus three times the identity means literally that I subtract three on the main diagonal and I create the matrix minus one, one. Well, the first row, subtract three, minus one, subtract nothing, one. Second row, subtract nothing, one. Subtract minus three, minus one. This is the matrix A minus lambda I. Some people call it quite descriptively, the adjusted matrix. Now think about this adjusted matrix and multiply by a vector that gets me zero, zero. Let's think about this, but let's write it out in ordinary math language, right? Let's write this out in ordinary math language. Minus x plus y is zero. That's first row down in the first column. And x minus y is zero. What if you had to solve this system? You know, this is like from your algebra days, right? Could you give me a pair of numbers that makes this sentence true? Well, both of these sentences true at the same time. In a way, these two sentences are repeats of each other. So it's not hard to find numbers that make both of these sentences true. I would just have to pick a Y that equals the X. Both of these equations become Y equals X, right? So one, one, seven, seven. Negative three, negative three. Those are all solutions to this system. That's how you used to say it in your algebra class. In my linear algebra class, I'm going to say one, one, seven, seven, and minus three, minus three, among billions of others, are all eigenvectors of A associated, associated with what? Associated with the eigenvalue three, because they came from the calculation when I formed the adjusted matrix with lambda equals three. Now, I don't want to go back to algebra land with you. So I want to do something much, much easier. When you take this row and dot it with x, y, you get zero. And when you take this row, dot it with x, y, and get zero. And actually, both these rows are the same, multiplied by minus one. But let's talk about common sense. What matrix vector do I dot with to get zero? Remember, in just a two-dimensional sense, when you dotted two vectors, what did it mean to dot two vectors to get zero? It meant the vectors were perpendicular. 
And how do I create a vector that's perpendicular to three, four? Only in the silliest way possible. I switch the two numbers. Well, that won't work because that's 12 plus 12 is 24. No, no, I switch the two numbers and change one sign. By switching the two numbers and changing one of the signs in two dimensions, I'm not talking about any other dimensions, in two dimensions, that automatically creates perpendicular vector, right? So what I'm asking for is what vector is simultaneously perpendicular to one negative one and one and negative one, or negative one, one and one negative one. All I have to do is switch these two numbers, one negative one and change one of the signs. I'll change the negative sign so I don't have to deal with two negatives. The eigenvector is one, one. And I do not need to do algebra in the two-dimensional case to show this. I just need to use common sense. Let's try it on the other one, a minus lambda two i. And that is two, one, one, two minus one times one, one, zero, zero minus the identity. What's that matrix? That matrix means subtract one on the main diagonal, subtract one on the main diagonal, Give me a one, 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 one. I don't want you to think too hard. Give me a vector that's simultaneously perpendicular to one, one and one, one. All I have to do is switch these two numbers, snap, snap. See, I switched them and change one of the signs. That vector is automatically perpendicular to the first row and the second row. That's the eigenvector. I could have chosen minus one, one. I could have switched the sign of the first. I could have chosen 52 and minus 52. But there's just a common sense thing here, right? Why don't I pick the easiest one I can? Why didn't I pick minus one, one? I could have picked minus one, one and it would have worked. I just like to lead with positives. So on the handouts that I gave you that I told you you got to read, I give you advice for picking eigenvectors. All you have to do is switch these two numbers and change a sign. But I just give you some general advice for picking eigenvectors. And that is pick the simplest ones that are possible. Don't pick 52 and minus 52, pick one and one minus. What's my next piece of advice? Lead with a positive when you can because it'll make our future calculations a little bit easier. Third piece of advice when you read that handout says, zero and one are your friends. Use them whenever you can. Don't use, you know, I could have said one seventh and minus one seventh. I could have said pi over four and minus pi over four, but what's the point? Why didn't I pick the easiest one I can? So that created this solution to the differential equation. The previous one, created this solution to the differential equation. Now I want you to go now, because our time's up. We'll tell you the importance of these later, but you can also be reading the recommended problems. I forgot to mention, well, I didn't forget, but remember you got tons of recommended problems to help you work this out. You got a powerful question in your mind right now, like why the heck did that work? You know, like, What's this voodoo that you're doing? Why should I believe that this is what you're supposed to do? Well, I'll tell you why it works next time. But first, I had to demonstrate what it means for something to even work. So you go read in the problems in section 3.1. You can poke into section 3.2. Section 3.2, they would have done this calculation for you. And with this kind of primer, you can make sense out of what the book is saying to you. But I realize this is not, this is worthless to you unless I tell you why it works. I'll tell you why it works next time. Okay, wrap up your tests. Send me a question if you have a question. 
you know, you guys got this, just put things together neatly. Then you can turn to your attention to reading chapter one. Go watch the videos and read some of the handouts I gave you. And then it'll also make what thing I said today much more sense too. But then we'll have some more fun with matrices next time. Okay, I'm going to hit the stop recording button.